19 time for uh, I'd like to introduce our Director of Government Relations, Ms. Christina Olman, who will be uh, already the second half. Christina. Thank you, Murray. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure of moderating our second uh, panel discussion today, Edges of the Empire. The Chinese Communist Party is an expansionist power that seeks to control every area that has ever been subject to China's historical imperial rule. Its view of greater China inevitably clashes with the legitimate desires of other peoples to determine their own economic, political, and cultural destinies. In its 70 year history, and we mark the 70th anniversary next week, as has already been noted, the Chinese Communist Party has declared war on its own people, culture, and history. And in the process, it has killed more Chinese people than any other entity in human history. This June, we marked the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square Massacre. And this November, we will mark the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. While nations in Europe in 1989 witnessed the fall of communism, in China, thousands of citizens who were simply calling for democratic reforms were mowed down by tents. Today, the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in a campaign to scientize all religions, to ensure that their every word, deed, and even thought conforms to the interests of the CCP. The human rights crisis in Xinjiang represents, as Secretary of State Pompeo recently said, the state of the century. On this panel, we will look at the interference of the CCP, motivated by the strength of their ambitions and the so-called uh, autonomous provinces of Tibet and Xinjiang, the special administrative region of Hong Kong, and Taiwan, officially known as the Republic of China. And uh, our third panel uh, today, following this uh, panel discussion, will delve into China's foreign policy ambitions, including its Belt and Road Initiative. So we have a very distinguished panel here today to discuss this topic. Uh, you have received their complete biography, so I will keep the introductions brief. On my very left, we have Mateo Mukashi, Mateo is the president of the International Campaign to Tibet and a former Italian member of parliament who advanced the human rights and democracy agenda both in Italy and globally. He formerly served as a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies and was a member of the Italian delegation to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Dr. Adrian Zenz is a professor at the European School of Culture and Theology in Germany. He researches China's policy toward ethnic minorities, specifically the Uyghurs and Tibetans. Dr. Zen is a leading researcher of the escalating crackdown on the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, and his work has been widely cited in publications like the Washington Post, the New York Times, Foreign Policy, and a number of others. Nathan Wong is a politician and activist in Hong Kong. He has been a student activist since 2013, and in 2016, he became the youngest ever democratically elected legislator in Asia. In 2014, he became one of the student leaders of the Umbrella Revolution. And following the protests, he was arrested along with other student leaders. In 2016, Nathan and other leaders of the Umbrella Revolution formed Dempsey Stoke, a new political party which aimed to fight for the right to self-determination of the Hong Kong people when the one country, two systems expires in 2047. Nathan became the founding chairman of the new party and after receiving 50,000 votes, the second highest among all candidates for the 60th Hong Kong Island constituency, he was elected to the Legislative Council, but was later disqualified in 2017. He and other leaders of the Umbrella Movement were nominated by the Congressional Executive Commission on China for the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. And finally, Ian Easton, to my right, is a research fellow at the Project 2049 Institute, where he conducts research on defense and security issues in Asia. 
in order to have A from 2005 to 2010. During his time in Taiwan, he worked as a translator and conducted research with the Asia Bureau Chief of Defense News. He is the author of the Chinese Invasion Threats, Taiwan's Defense and American Strategy in Asia. Uh, each panel will give uh, opening statements of no more than 10 minutes. And we will then open it up to a moderated discussion and Q&A with the audience. And we will begin with the remarks of Mateo, who is going to speak to us about the CCP's repression in Tibet. Thank you, Mateo. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for inviting me and uh, your initial opportunities uh, uh, this conference together. Um, I will try to be brief uh, because I think you invite us to that analysts as we move forward. But when it comes to Tibet, I think it's important this whole we're talking about the seven years and there's actually when the Chinese Communist Party took over in 1949, immediately after that started the revision in the revision of Tibet. Um, then there was a number of years in which the, the government the Tibetan government tried to negotiate and find a way to to, to maintain some control and then uh, So it's also the 60th anniversary of you know, the Tibet government and the Dalai Lama being into, into exile. So uh, since then, this is what we know in this room, but I think it's important to remember there have been, uh, when it comes to China's policy in Tibet, there have been waves of repression uh, from the Dutch Revolution and destruction to periods of more, let's say, liberalization. Uh, Periods of in which uh, the Chinese government has also somehow acknowledged that the Lama could play a major role in finding a political solution, but all these have always been followed by more repression and more alienation uh, to the people of the land. And this is the reality in which, uh, in which we are now. The problem for the, for the Chinese government is that despite these seven years, 60 years of doing in that, um, they know that they have no belief in that uh, They know that the Tibetan people um, follow them, uh, they try to abide with the decision, um, they have to follow in every field of their life. But the Chinese government know that they have no trust in the people. And so, although you may think that, you know, what can 6 million Tibetan people do in China when there is 1 million, 400 million people and the uh, seventh biggest economy in the world, millions of members of the PLA. Actually, uh, Tibet is a, a big problem for, for China. And the, the fact that they have chosen repression as a way to rule uh, shows very clearly that there is a weakness there. It's also how the system is built, the system of government. China overall is built specifically in Tibet. Uh, as you know, they have tried also to co opt the Tibetan leadership globally, the regional and provincial level. But when it comes to decision making, all uh, you know, CCP party positions in Tibet are held by ethnic Chinese. So what they present as autonomy, as, a, as an opportunity uh, for Tibetans to, to run the businesses and their you know, the cultural affairs, the religious affairs, actually uh, is a completely top-down approach, which is being imposed uh, by the Chinese since then. And this is the model of government that they have implemented throughout, throughout China. So this is something that uh, requires, from the Chinese government perspective, key investments in Tibet. Um, uh, the amount of public money that is spent in Tibet uh, uh, is uh, the, the highest in the entire in China uh, because they, they think that through economic, you know, somehow forced economic development and vision can, can develop that uh, much more because you've been doing research on this. They think that somehow they can try to buy the consensus of the people. Uh, they have to invest a lot in security, in security, which is a huge part now of the Chinese uh, uh, government. And this is because they they haven't had the, I would say, the courage, maybe they cannot afford, uh, uh, 
to really try to engage uh, with the Lam who over the last three decades has been very clear that has not been calling for independence of Tibet, has been requesting uh, what he says a genuine autonomy according to the rules set out now in the Chinese constitution. So not even going beyond what is in the Chinese constitution at the starting point. Uh, but somehow, I think there are hurdles to come center because when you have a, a authoritarian and a hurdle system, there is a lot of fear in changing any rules in any government, government system that may uh, undermine the overall uh, system of government in China. And so the reality of life in Tibet uh, is very dark. Uh, I mean, there's no work. There is no human kind as we see you know, in other places in the world, but actually Freedom House lists Tibet as the second least region in the world after Syria. And this is because basically in Tibet there are no civil liberties. If you are arrested, it's almost impossible even to get a lawyer. Uh, and you can be arrested because you, know, you shout in the street along the ladies of the Dalai or maybe you celebrate uh, in a private place uh, his birthday. There are being monks who are being sent to prison for celebrating the birthday of Dalai Lama. Or if you write a petition and go to Beijing to ask <coughs> that the local government teaches the better language to your kids according to the Chinese legislation and you must work for them further, you get five years in prison. So, um, these are all kinds of countries, but we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people who are part of this way. Uh, and this is the way China moves uh, in Tibet. So there is this lack of weakness in the eyes of the Tibetan people. And uh, it's not just me saying, but in 2008, um, 11 years ago, the largest demonstration took place across the Tibetan plateau. That was after you know, 60, 50 years after the government had left. And uh, so you could say that two <coughs> generations after the government had left, you still have people um, rising up and asking for um, user term and reforms uh, to the rules. Um, but since then, we know that you know, China has also increased its repression, has, in, has increased uh, its influence over the world. We all know that 2008 was also the last, uh, the beginning of the last big recession that has hit uh, the you know, uh, market economies. And that uh, in many countries, even in the United States, the European governments, who at that time had reached out to China for opening the Chinese market to their, to their products. And the Chinese at that time, they clearly and explicitly used uh, uh, the Dalai Lama card asking foreign governments to stop meeting and as you may remember uh, the Dalai over the years has been received by leaders in Europe and the United States and since then uh, you know there was a decrease in uh, this kind of opportunities. Uh, and overall in Tibet and then in Xinjiang a more repressive uh, policy of total surveillance has been implemented and actually the, the current Secretary General of Xinjiang region tested many of the policies in the Tibet region, so we can, can talk more about that. Um, so now there is this uh, lack of legitimacy, and uh, the Chinese leadership acknowledges that very, very clearly. They know that the Dalai Lama historically has played a major role in granting to any government the legitimacy in Tibet. But instead of trying to find a political solution, how they have chosen a different road. Since 2007 and then in 2017, the Chinese uh, Communist Party and the Chinese government, they have adopted a legislation that will keep the Chinese Communist Party and government the right to select the next seven months. Uh, this is not unprecedented. Already in 1995, uh, Senator Cruz mentioned that uh, the Chinese government Attacked. The body was six years old at the time. Uh, the country was 
identify one of the major spiritual figures in Tibet. And he was elected. He was elected in the 70s, and he has been since the 80s. They replaced him to the Chinese elected Vajra Now, historically, the Vajra and the Vajra have had a role in identifying the successor. And so the Chinese now are planning clearly is to have a system in which they will have the own faith and the working to identify when the time will come the faith and the And they think that this will give the difference to the world. Actually, they are that wrong because the faith and the has no real problem with that. And actually, there will be, um, I think this will be for the Tibetan people the ultimate whistle to their identity, religion, and uh, it would be something that you know, actually would be, uh, would be opposed. Uh, uh, we think, you know, that public opinion internationally, and lastly, and I know that I have finished my time, but just recently, uh, then this book in the House of Representatives, and this week in the Senate, there's a new bill uh, that's been introduced uh, in the Senate by Senator Julio and in the House by Jim Gover, which revisit the Tibetan the Tibet Policy Act, which is all of uh, the legislation of U.S. policy on that, and specifically speaks about the question of the succession to the Dalai Lama, and uh, it says, it says very clearly that it's up to the Tibetan people and to the Dalai Lama to identify the process and who will be the next Dalai Lama, but not only that, the Chinese officials who will be uh, responsible for the the process could be uh, subject to sanctions basically uh, very similar to the Chinese sanctions that we have uh, already uh, seen. So I think this is uh, something that uh, I think you know, the international community uh, needs to be aware of because you know, China is not just you know, struggling to control the situation in Tibet, but by controlling Tibetan Buddhism, and Tibetan Buddhism is not popular in many other countries, actually they are fighting to control really the soul of Tibet, which is often, you know, Allow also to uh, to the world outside of uh, of that. So thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Matteo. As you said, uh, Tibet is the place where the CCP first exercised its surveillance and cultural exile policies, and we will now hear from Dr. Zenz about how uh, the CCP is perfecting. Uh, those tactics to an unimaginable scale in Xinjiang. Dr. Thank you very much. Yes, I have a PowerPoint which can start the front slide. I will have uh, about 10 minutes to just very briefly give an overview of the latest developments in the area of Xinjiang. Not all of you are familiar, so in the next slide we'll see a map of the area, the northwest. China with approximately 11 to 12 million leaders, a total of about 14 to 15 million Turkey minorities that are being targeted. The weakest are China's largest Muslim minority. Next slide, please. Today I'll speak very briefly about the internal campaign, focusing on re education, on intergenerational separation of parents and children, and on Beijing's long term strategy in the area to different forms of coercive labor. Next slide. The historical context of re-education in China goes back a long way and is in fact an um, uh, integral part of communist regimes. The Laojiao system, which actually has been officially established, started uh, officially the practice of re-education for labor, which was then uh, sort of renamed transformation for education, particularly applied to Falun sect members, and uh, now is the official terminology for the re-education of Muslims, but not only Muslims, also Christians, atheists, and others in Xinjiang. Next slide, please. Transformation to education is what Beijing is actually doing in Xinjiang, and it does not like to talk about that. It prefers to distract knowing there's nothing to gain from openly disputing the detailed trail of evidence that we have between past and current forms of re-education or transformation to education. And then at the same time, 
as China is starting to embark on its propaganda initiative in mid or late 2018, many references to this concept were carefully removed and also avoided. However, there's a large discrepancy between public facing propaganda, globally facing propaganda, and domestic or internally facing uh, documentation. The next slide briefly shows you the October 2018 amendment to Xinjiang's Sea Experimentation Ordinance, which in fact made the concept of transformation to education even more explicit in the experimentation work than it had previously been. In particular, it is now linked to vocational skills training. Vocational skills training is, of course, the core of Beijing's, Beijing's propaganda narrative in the region. This document clearly says that vocational skills training centers are re education institutions. The main aim of establishing them is to strengthen the effectiveness of transformation to education. Next slide, please. We can discern approximately at least eight different types of re education or extra judicial internment facilities in Xinjiang. Uh, this, of course, will take a long time to go through or explain. Just in red highlighted is the term for transformation to education, which I've explained to you. It's linked to the brutal uh, brainwashing of the Falun Gong, of the uh, course, isolated detoxification, etc. It features very prominently, but Beijing prefers to only speak about the type of facility listed here under number eight vocational skills, education, and training centers. Next slide, please. Chinese government documents are highly incriminating when they are not speaking to a global public. According to their own documents, the vocational training internment camps, which is how I refer to these facilities, in official terms, vocational skills, education, training centers, quote unquote, wash clean the brains of people who became bewitched by the extreme religious ideologies of the three forces. It's a quote from the government. Next slide, please. However, we have, especially this year, been recognizing that Beijing's strategy in Xinjiang is going far beyond mere internment. Beijing has a long-term strategy. It did not just lock up a million or more uh, we as a number of minorities in Xinjiang without uh, thinking um, out an entire scheme for how it wants to facilitate, facilitate this coercive social reengineering. Some evidence of this is related to intergenerational separation of parents and children. Uh, for example, expanded public school capacity to care for children full time. Preschool enrollment increases per region have been particularly stunning on the very right hand, which are uh, weaker uh, majority regions. Unfortunately, I see the labels are cut off at the bottom of it. But the first on the left is full time prefecture, which is uh, uh, almost 100% weaker, over 90% weaker. And then the second on the right is weaker um, dominated regions in Xinjiang. And then first on the left, you have the national figures. Next slide, please. Notably, just in time for the re-education campaign, the region has urgently established a vast and systematic network of care and boarding infrastructure capable of offering full-time care for children of nearly all ages. That's why the strategy is to have a comprehensive public education system that can care for children through comprehensive boarding facilities, full-time, no matter whether they have parents at home or not. And this was originally scheduled to be completed by 2020, but after Chen Shenguo, who previously was in Tibet for five years, from 2011 to 16, became party secretary in Xinjiang. The deadline was moved forward to late 2017, coinciding with the internment and re-education campaign. Next slide, please. I think to understand Beijing's long-term goal probably not only in Xinjiang, but in all of China, and unfortunately also in Hong Kong, we have to understand the weaponization of education. Education is becoming a crucial long-term assimilation tool for the communist government. You see, between the years I cut off, but the bottom years range from 2015 to 18, you see between
between 2017 and 18, uh, spending on domestic security, which previously had increased dramatically, actually slightly declined. Maybe not surprising because the 2017 spending was truly um, incredible. But education spending has kept to increase notably in 2018. The increase was higher than the preceding years. That's because education is the next long term assimilation tool after internment or concurrent with internment. <coughs> next slide, please. The third phase that Beijing is moving into, especially as it has now been claimed to release uh, Uyghurs from detention and internment, which is happening to an extent gradually, is different forms of coercive or involuntary labor. Here, the government has a large scale strategy of so called fine grain poverty alleviation, which is an all encompassing scheme. There's a fire on every citizen in their poverty alleviation status. Now, poverty alleviation in China means all kinds of things, including you have to get a wage job if that increases your uh, income above the government poverty threshold. Because if you live in China, you cannot live below the poverty line, or else you are an embarrassment to Xi Jinping. Now, there are some people who resist this co-optation, which of course comes with a whole package of uh, other factors, including having to work in factories uh, all day long, and being, uh, having family structures changed by that. So the government talks about changing the attitude of minority citizens from I'm asked to get rid of poverty, meaning the government wants me to do it, to I want to get rid of poverty. This is another form of free education. Industry-based poverty elevation is a standard expression that in Xinjiang and elsewhere that means moving vast numbers of rural minority populations into labor-intensive industries that are low skilled. Um, a particular role here is played by garment and textile industries, and the Xinjiang government has published a goal of by 2033 wanting to have one million workers in these industries, of them two thirds from the southern Uyghur majority regions. Much more could be said on this topic. And I move on to my final slide. Under Xi Jinping, we are seeing a brutal, detailed, technology driven crackdown on any competing ideology. Much could be said to what my colleague here said about Tibet. Uh, Tibetans see all kinds of times where you could have a picture of the Dalai Lama, and you could live in China, and you could, uh, you could run parallel tracks. Or you could be a con convicted Christian or Muslim, you could run parallel tracks. <coughs> These times are over. The, key, uh, the CCP is driven by deep insecurities, China celebrating having survived the Soviet Union by one year next month. Apparently, Beijing attempts to create a long term generational solution in its restive minority regions, particularly because these regions now have geopolitical significance beyond the borders through the Battle Group Initiative. Uh, Xinjiang, especially, has become a center. It is no longer the periphery. Because the periphery now has expanded to Central Asia, the Middle East, etc. Therefore, Xinjiang, again, is a testing ground for long-term intergenerational change for the creation of a young generation firmly attached to the CCP anywhere in China and Hong Kong and elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. Nathan. Hello everyone, I'm, I'm Nathan. Um, so uh, first of all, I just finished a Senate hearing uh, at a building next to the desk. So I just like ran here and um, kind of uh, half free in the middle of uh, that process. But luckily, I made it on time. I'm really glad to see you all and share my experience about Hong Kong and um, about China generally. So, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I think a lot of you may have read the news about Hong Kong for the past three months. And um, not surprisingly, there are a lot of questions that pop in your heads. Whether well, Hong Kong is just a economic entity, why people protest? Is Hong Kong disposable that China will re, re well re, remember that incident happened in 1989 in Cameron uh, Square? Is Hong Kong um, a place that uh, well these protests are well, based on what kind of legitimacy and moral ground? So they arouse 
such a unified crowd and the attention from the world? So I think these questions um, may intrigue you into looking into Hong Kong. And I want to share about Hong Kong and therefore answering those questions. Uh, the, the struggle that Hong Kong we are having now for like, a long one and after uh, or three months of things and that's setting into 110 days is actually uh, one that uh, is a public explosion of is an explosion of public anger that accumulated for a long period of time. Hong Kong's democratic movement has been held for almost four decades. In the 1980s, when Hong Kong people were very worried about the transfer of sovereignty from British to the Chinese government, which uh, the sign of British Shore Declaration was uh, signed in the year 1984, uh, well, there was uh, overwhelming worry from Hong Kong people there, and there were massive waves of immigration. So that you could see a lot of um, Hong Kong community in Canada and in the US that had been deep rooted for more than three decades. Well, back then, Hong Kong people were worried about uh, whether their free society and uh, a relatively democratic society will be assimilated after the return to the sovereignty of China. So after that, China and uh, the British government had signed a, a declaration, which I, will, I have mentioned, to ensure Hong Kong people that we will enjoy prosperity and dignity after the hangover in 1997, which governed by a couple of rules. First, one country, two system principle, which when we are part of uh, China, we are autonomous part and enjoy our autonomy. Second, uh, high degree of autonomy, that is uh, the, the, the rule that I mentioned, and uh, we remain separated system from China uh, in terms of democratic way of life, in terms of our capitalist, uh, well, capitalist system and some other relevant areas. And the third one is Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, which is basically ensuring Hong Kong people that we will have a democracy in the future, possibly in some, some years like 20, 2007 and so on. So these are promises made by China, and the Southern British Shore Declaration is actually released in the United Nations. And back then, in the 1980s, there were numerous countries supporting that treaty, including the US and Canada, in which they, uh, the Communist Party used to ensure Hong Kong people that they have a future. But after 1997, we could see that the human rights situation and our uh, freedom has been encroached. So we could see that the particular movement that we are having is actually a reflection of the furious, um, furious um, sentiments about China revolting its promises and fight for Hong Kong's freedom and democracy. Well, some of you may think that um, in, such a per in such a circumstance, is uh, China going to uh, reoccur a kind of massacre in Hong Kong? Yes or no? Because uh, for now, I, even though there were troops sent into the border of Hong Kong, we can still see that Hong Kong is not disposable. It, it still plays an important role in China's economy. For example, uh, Hong Kong now is the largest um, source of getting money in, getting the FBI in China, and getting money out of China. And Hong Kong has always been the large, largest um, refugee center overseas. And also, Hong Kong has been playing a crucial role crucial role in the Belt and Road Initiative, which supports the ambition of China to become an expansionist, uh, exporting of the current ruling, and also um, getting rid of the world order now. So uh, you see these uh, roles of Hong Kong playing in the China uh, economy, and also the role as, as, as um, their foreign policy is irreplaceable, because Hong Kong enjoys the freedom of information, freedom of capital, freedom of human um, well, free freedom of uh, human talents, and all sorts of things that help them build a strong financial center, which uh, the other cities in China do not have first. So, um, well, about 10 years ago, when I heard uh, this was about Shanghai, um, well, uh, Beijing, Shenzhen is getting, uh, is getting uh, the kind of uh, override in Hong Kong, but for now, these, doesn't, these um, do not came, come to uh, the reality because of the restrictions that the communist system in mainland China poses. So I do believe that uh, if, uh, if China has cracked down Hong Kong, they may and must be posed in huge danger towards its economy. 
and the way Hong Kong people protest. Uh, and I think uh, the demands that they are proposing ultimately the economy and democracy because they are all the promise from Beijing certainly laid out a huge uh, moral ground for Hong Kong people and a strong support in the international level. We, we saw that um, the uh, Orient Committee of uh, the House and the Orient Relations Committee of the Senate, they both passed the Hong Kong uh, Human Rights and Democracy Act and what are left is for the clause to pass it. And I have confidence that this could be passed in uh, this year uh, with the, the uh, strong support, strong bipartisan support, and also the caring attitude of the congressman. And the reason why we got such overwhelming support is not because um, we have a great obvious team in DC, actually we don't have it. This is because our initiative and the, with the things that we're fighting for are legitimate. We just want China to, um, well, kind of do what they have promised. And these are very humble demands that we don't ask for more and we don't ask for less. So I do think that the support that we're having is leading us to a um, well, kind of a more happy international support. And of course, the tenacious, uh, uh, tenacious attitude of Hong Kong people is crucial in, in that matter because uh, even though under excessive brutality from the police, we are uh, fearless. And even though uh, those, those, those frontline kids who with their age maybe 14, 15 or some, or even younger, they face rough borders and tear gas and unlimited uh, restriction of the use of force from, from the police. They still stand in the front line. These images in determination also moved people who saw the images and saw the video about them. So I do think that um, this practice indeed constructs a strong support for Hong Kong's movement and a moral boost for of our values there. Because of uh, these criteria, and we realize that actually we are privileged in the Chinese soil because, like for Xinjiang, for Tibet, they don't have that exposure because they don't have that um, free of information as so many media agencies in Hong Kong. And that's why, time to time, we have to voice out more about um, not only the situation happening in Hong Kong, but China as a whole, because we are facing the same coherent tactics that China wanted to apply in the places that show different of culture, different of determination, and things that deviate from Chinese ruling. And uh, there's a prevailing saying in Hong Kong, like, today, Xinjiang, tomorrow, Hong Kong. Today, Hong Kong, tomorrow, Taiwan. So you can see how tightly connected our situation is and how we should share a same sense of worry about things not only in Hong Kong, not only in Taiwan, these more democratic and liberal places, but also in Xinjiang and Tibet. And I do believe that um, the, the worry that we all share could indeed boost the attention and the help and, and the much needed help and hands from the international community to places all around China. So, um, well, it's not me for things happening in Hong Kong, it's not only things uh, that Hong Kong people care or just about Hong Kong. It's the forefront of fighting against authoritarian ruling and liberal ruling. And it's important that uh, the global community to, to be aware of the export of authoritarian and authoritarianism from China and take action to stop it. We, we have experienced um, revival of the autocracy of the authoritarian regime and the reset of the democratic values. And there's a, there are reasons for that, and there are fruits of that. And Chinese ruling, overwhelmingly expanding worldwide, is definitely one of the root causes. So when a lot of Americans talk about the worry of democracy, the worry of um, like regimes like China, we need concrete action. We need policy to be made to specifically targeting its expansion and its ambition to be the leading of the terror regime to show that um, authoritarianism is not um, is not worse than democracy, and this attitude should be condemned. So I think um, this platform made a good demonstration of how much media support in uh, in China, but in Hong Kong and other places. And I'm looking forward to, to the U.S. and U.S. to take comprehension with. We will now hear from our final speaker for this panel, Ian Easton. Well, very good afternoon to you all. It is a great pleasure to be here, and I am delighted to have this opportunity to 
share a few thoughts with you all on the threat that the Chinese Communist Party poses to Taiwan, and by extension, to our own national security interests here in the United States. First, let me state up front that I believe that the Taiwan Strait is the single most dangerous flashpoint on the planet, and it's getting worse. If you look at South Korea, or Poland, or Israel, the chance that they're going to get blockaded or invaded is not zero, but it's close to zero. The same cannot be said of Taiwan. China has nuclear weapons. Taiwan does not. Think about that. Think about the power disparity just, just there. We have no US troop station in Taiwan to serve as a strategic tripwire the way we did in West Berlin during the Cold War. We don't even do ship visits to Taiwan. We don't even do military exercises with the Taiwanese military. Even worse is the flimsy state of our diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. Officially, we have none. Taiwan is the only advanced democracy in the world that does not enjoy the fundamental security that comes from the diplomatic relationship and a mutual defense treaty with the United States of America. It's the only one. Now, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan have been increasingly robust, but they're always fraught with uncertainty. They're never easy. Never. And I can tell you that the recent sales of F-16 and Abrams tanks to Taiwan were extremely difficult, and they were uncertain until the very last moments. U.S. diplomats have gone out of their way to discourage the Taiwanese military from maintaining a credible self-defense posture. We have prevented the Taiwanese from buying or building ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, stealth fighter bombers, long-range drones, and a whole host of other defensive and offensive military capabilities that are manifestly needed for deterring the Chinese invasion. The very same capabilities that we put in Japan and South Korea to defend our own forces and our own allies from a potential attack, we deny Taiwan because it might irritate Beijing. The CCP's spear tactics have, by and large, succeeded in paralyzing hard decisions in Washington and in Taipei and in Tokyo and in Seoul and in Canberra and other regional capitals who have a vested interest in this. This is a collective problem. And it, at least in my view, it's a collective failure. It's a failure across democratic administrations, across public administrations, across PPP governments and KMT governments. We don't even have a, a reasonable theory of deterrence when it comes to Taiwan, to the defense of Taiwan. We have no theory of deterrence. We have a war plan. We're prepared to fight a war. The Taiwanese have their own war plan, and they're prepared to fight a war. But we don't know how to prevent one. And we have no theory of preventing an attack. The reason we have no theory is because we don't know how to communicate our red lines to Beijing. Because we don't know what our red lines are. And we don't know what we'll do if the Chinese Communist Party should cross them. That, that's in my mind, is, it's, it's insanity. We don't know how to control escalation in this scenario. We don't know what our political goals are for the future of Taiwan. Neither do the people of Taiwan, the leaders of Taiwan. So, by definition, our strategic thinking on this issue is very feeble. Again, there's no other flashpoint like this on the planet. This is as bad as it gets. And most people are so afraid of what Beijing thinks that they won't talk about it. Most academics and researchers that I know won't even think about this. Won't even think about it. It's too scary. And if you're not willing to think about it, you're certainly not willing to do anything that might make a difference for the sake of peace. 
Now, science and reason tell us that Marxism and Leninism is wrong. There's no such thing as historic or scientific inevitability. Nothing's inevitable. Nothing that happens is preordained. The future has not been written. History is made by the decisions of those in positions of power and responsibility. Men and women make history through their actions, and sometimes through their inaction. So, is time running out? Does Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party high command and Zhou Nanhai, do they have a timetable for the annexation or the invasion of Taiwan? It's uncertain. I don't know. But they think. We do know that in November 2012, Xi Jinping secretly pledged to continue the Taiwan work of Chairman Hu Jintao. She swore to his colleagues at the, at the 18th Party Congress in Beijing that he would get the CCP and his armed wing, the People's Liberation Army, ready for an offensive war of conquest against Taiwan by the year 2020. Now, notably, she did not say how he would judge the PLA's readiness. And he didn't comment on whether or not he would use the military option once he did feel it was ready. Like any other politician, he left himself plenty of new. Nonetheless, we have solid evidence that suggests that she and the CCP do intend to attack Taiwan at some point in the foreseeable future. What point, we don't know. In January 2016, the CCP launched a sweeping military reform and reorganization program. It was the first time that anything like this had happened in the 70-year history of communist China. Now, giant military bureaucracies are famously hard to change. And everybody knows, every, certainly every civilian leader knows, that it can be dangerous for your own personal interest and indeed your life to try to go up against the vested interests of an authoritarian military. To succeed, Chairman Xi has had to fire, imprison, and in several cases, execute well over 100 high-ranking generals in just a few years' time, and more purges are coming. But why did he take such a risky path in the first place? Why did he do it? Well, Xi has suggested that he had no better option, that he had to do it, because China needed a joint force capable of fighting and winning China's future wars. Well, anybody who's familiar with PLA war plans will tell you that the major war that they envision is a war of conquest directed against Taiwan. We are now watching as China builds exactly the type of military that it needs to invade Taiwan and to defeat the United States military in the Pacific. A further warning sign came this January. January 2nd, right after New Year, Xi Jinping gathered a large theater audience in Beijing. And in front of them, he said that the annexation of Taiwan, what he would call unification, or sometimes we mistranslate it as reunification, that is a must have. It's an essential part of his plans for China's future. He said that he refused to renounce the use of force, and he stated, and I quote, Taiwan independence will lead to a dead end. Then this July, the CCP released its 2019 defense white paper. Let me just provide a short translation. It said, and I quote, solving the Taiwan problem and achieving complete national unification is in the fundamental interest of the Chinese race, not the PRC, but the entire Chinese race. It is obviously necessary for achieving the Chinese race's great renewal China must be unified and obviously will be. If anybody splits Taiwan from off of China, China's military will pay any price to totally defeat them, to protect national unification. Now these are, of course, radical statements. They're completely detached from reality. China hasn't been unified for 70 years. Taiwan, under its Republic of China constitution, has long existed as an independent country. Underscoring this United States had an embassy in Taipei for 30 years. So while the CCP won't admit it, 
There are actually two different countries on either side of the Taiwan Strait. And Xi Jinping is denying the facts and he's also denying the rights of individuals to chart their own course. Now, as a final note, when we consider the threat to Taiwan, the threat to liberal democracy, the only thing that we can conclude with absolute confidence is that there's no reason for panic or despair in Taipei or in Washington, but every region, every good reason for vigilance and for resolve. Thank you.